If I was to tell you that I flew here today without the need of an aircraft, such as a helicopter or an airplane, would you believe me? Would you? Thanks. But if instead, what if I told you that I did use a piece of technology, but that technology had rockets in the boots, rockets in the back, and rockets in the hands, and the gauntlets and gloves? Does that sound more believable? Yeah, sure. OK, so seriously, all joking aside, that's not how I got here. So how I got here was, I've got my very own web slingers. They fire web, and I can swing from building to building and tree to tree and get anywhere I want. And that's exactly how I got here today. Does that sound believable? Absolutely. Of course, every one of these things I've just mentioned is preposterous. I got driven here today. But these powers that I've just mentioned, these abilities, or these superpowers, are something that have consumed us for more than 60 years. And you never know, they could become part of our future. Now, I'm sure there are many people in this room and many people who are watching me right now at home who have dreamed about superpowers at some time. I'm sure that everybody in this room has dreamed about doing something extraordinary, something they cannot do naturally. Clearly, I'm a dreamer. I've just mentioned that I would like to fly. And clearly, I have some sort of obsession with this since I gave you three examples of how I could do it. Now, I've channeled my obsession with flight or my obsession with superpowers into writing a book. And in that book, I outline technological paths towards creating superpowers in the future. The thing is, why are superpowers so interesting? And why would I talk about the superhero films in the first place? Well, we stand in the middle of a cinematic superhero revolution. In the year 2000, the X-Men film was released, directed by Brian Singer, who also directed The Usual Suspects, and starring Patrick Stewart as Professor Xavier and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. It was a game changer. I absolutely loved it. But for me, that's where the superhero film revolution started. Now, I don't want to discount the Batman films from the 90s and the Superman films from the 70s and 80s, but that film in 2000 really set things going. And since then, there have been countless films, and they've been very, very successful. Three of those films have made more than a billion dollars at the box office. That's The Avengers in 2012, Iron Man 3, 2013, and Avengers Age of Ultron last year. This year is going to see the release of six films alone, at least six superhero films. One of which has already come out, and that's Deadpool. It is awesome. You've got to go see Deadpool. It is brilliant. Now, two other films that are going to come out this year could break that billion dollar barrier. One of them is Captain America Civil War, and the other one is Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Now, in Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, we're going to see Superman, the caped crusader, face off against Gotham City's greatest defender, the Dark Knight Batman. And surely it's a mismatch. Surely Superman is going to annihilate Batman. We just have to wait and see. But Superman is someone who can do some extraordinary things. For me, he's the pinnacle of all superheroes. He can do things we can only dream about. He has superhuman strength. He has X-ray vision. He can fire lasers from his eyes but possibly his most appealing ability and the most extraordinary ability he has is flight. And of course, I've started out at the start of this talk talking about it, so it's a good juncture to keep talking about it. Now, humanity has been obsessed with flight for centuries. I didn't start this obsession, clearly not. And one person who was also obsessed with this was Leonardo da Vinci, the sculptor and painter. Now, not only was he an artist, but he was also a scientist, and he designed his own flying machines. When in the hope that they will be built in his lifetime. Now, they never were. Disappointing for Da Vinci, maybe, you might say. But Da Vinci did realize something. He realized one important thing. We did not evolve to be able to fly naturally. He realized that we would need technological intervention in order for that to happen. He realized that we would need technology to be able to do super things. Now, in my opinion, a superhero is somebody who can do something extraordinary. Something we don't see every day, something you don't see on the street, or something you don't see in your cities. That's what a superhero does. Now, the comic book writers at Marvel Comics or DC Comics, when they were coming up with the stories, the origin stories for these characters, the superhero stories and their great crusades and battles, they used the world around us for their inspiration. They looked outside their windows and they looked at sport, at music, at entertainment, at culture, 
and at science to inspire them to come up with these particular characters. Now, they use different origin stories for some of these characters. Some of them were extraterrestrials or aliens. Some of them got their powers from magicians, while others got their powers from dedicated scientific research. Now, I'm here today to talk to you about the dedicated scientific research part. I have no evidence right now today, unfortunately for you, to, to tell you that aliens exist or do not exist. I cannot tell you that. And in terms of magicians, I don't believe in magic. But I do believe in science. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Eindhoven University of Technology. I work in a chemical engineering department, but I'm actually a physicist. So many people might think this is unusual, but it's actually very, very good for my research career. I get a different perspective on scientific research. Now, I've been doing a lot of research for many, many years, and I've used different fields of research to inspire me towards getting solutions towards scientific problems. That's very, very important. But not only within my own field of physics, I've looked outside those fields in chemistry, in biology, in advanced technology. Some of my colleagues are working on some of the most fascinating things you can imagine in physics, chemistry, and biology. And the big thing about it is we all inspire each other. Now, this leads me to a question. So the comic book writers, when they created all the characters, they looked at the world around them. They looked at everything we see and everything that you interact with. And they came up with some amazing stories. Now I'm going to reverse the question. Why can't scientists who work in research institutes not be inspired by what they see in the comic books or what they see in the superhero films? Why can't a scientific researcher ask questions about what they see in a film and use that to dictate how scientific research goes in the future? I'll give you an example. It's Tony Stark has this remarkable piece of technology sitting in his chest, the arc reactor. That powers his suits in Iron Man, Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3. Now this piece of technology, which is remarkable, doesn't exist. So I, as a scientist, will ask two questions. Why doesn't it exist? And can it exist? Now, in the comic books, you have businessmen and scientists who become superheroes. Tony Stark is a businessman. Of course, his story is, is a fictional story, but it's very, very interesting and grounded in the real world. At the age of 15, Tony Stark went to MIT. He graduated with a master's degree in electronic engineering. And at the age of 21, he took over the company of Stark Industries, inheriting the company from his parents. Tony Stark went on to turn Stark Industries into a world leader in developing weapons. And as we've seen in the later films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he changed the aim a little bit towards energy solutions. Tony Stark realized that, well, it's a good thing to save the environment. Now, of all the genius that he has and all the amazing things he's invented, Probably the best thing he has done is the Iron Man suit. I think it is the best invention to come out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What about Bruce Wayne? So Bruce Wayne in Gotham City, the owner of Wayne Industries, or Wayne Enterprises, my apologies. He has billions and billions of dollars. Wayne Enterprises provides healthcare, energy systems, and transport solutions to the good people of Gotham City. But Bruce Wayne uses his money for something else. He develops technologies and gizmos to help him fight villains or threats to the good people of Gotham City. And surely in Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice, Bruce Wayne is going to have some of the best devices he's ever had if he's going to overcome the Man of Steel. Now, what about the research scientists, scientists in the comic books? What about the people like me? Well, I can think of two examples straight off. Dr. Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four and Dr. Bruce Banner from the Avengers. Both of these characters who were dedicated scientific researchers got their powers because they were exposed to dangerous radiation. In Reed Richards' case, he was exposed to cosmic rays, and he got the power of stretchability. In Bruce Banner's case, he was exposed to gamma rays, and he got, well, a power that allows him to turn into a big, giant green guy called the Hulk. Now, both of these origin stories are very, very appealing, but in reality, Bruce Banner, if he was really exposed to gamma rays, should have died. He should have, been, he should have perished. He should not have got these incredible superpowers. Now, the thing about the comic book writers is that they don't have to follow the rules. They can make up stuff as it goes along because they're interested in one thing, to make the story entertaining for you because they want you to read it and be inspired by the stories you see and have the characters doing incredibly amazing and unexplainable things. However, that doesn't work for me. I'm a scientist and I have to follow rules, the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, and the findings of people for centuries and centuries, such as Newton and Einstein. Now, I'm not suggesting at any point in this talk, although this, is, this would be great, that every scientific research institute in the world 
all starts to focus on creating superpowers. I'd be really happy. I'm sure be many other people in the world would be too. I certainly would work at a research institute called the Secrets of Superhero Science Research Institute. So if there are, if there are any jobs going there, uh, I'm definitely going to send my application in. But in reality, what's going to happen is that current research and future research will help to produce technologies that will benefit mankind and will benefit society. But why can't superpowers emerge as viable spin-offs? Why can't we get superpowers out at the end as, you know, the nice little cake at the end, the nice little application that we never actually thought would come out of? Now, I'm going to give you some examples about real scientists, scientists right now and real research that could actually make superpowers become a reality. Now, invisibility is a power that I'm sure many people have thought about having at some stage. I'm sure that some of the speakers who came up here today at some point or another, maybe the first 10 seconds of this, of this talk, thought, please let me be invisible, please let me be invisible. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Now, invisibility is an incredible power that some characters possess in the comic books. Sue Storm from the Fantastic Four has this incredible ability. She can turn herself invisible. And how she can do this comes down to one thing. Her atoms and molecules can control how they interact with light. She can bend light around her body instead of having it reflected from it. That's how light and the eyes work. These two huge headlamps that are basically blind to me right now are sending light towards my body, which has been reflected, and then falling on top of you. Some of that light enters your eyes, and it's focused onto the back of your eye in an area called the retina. At the retina, it generates electrical and chemical impulses at the photoreceptor cells, which then send signals down your optic nerve into your brain. That then forms your image. Now, the thing is, if we could bend the light or control how the light interacts with an, an object, then we won't be able to see the object. Clearly, if I, the light doesn't get reflected back, reflected back towards me, I won't see that object. Now, believe it or not, there are people out there right now working on technologies that could actually do this. There are people working on materials called metamaterials that can be used to bend waves around objects to make objects appear invisible. These actually do exist. There are people that are using natural crystals to do exactly the same thing. And there are actually people who've made setups with optical lenses, no different from the lenses in my glasses or the lenses that are actually in your eyes, to be able to make objects appear invisible. It sounds extraordinary, right? But it may actually in the future happen that you may be able to make yourself invisible. Now, I spoke about Iron Man a few moments ago. Tony Stark's suit, which I think is, I would love to have one. See, I do have one. I'll tell you about that in a while. I would love that technology to be not in, in my own head at the moment. But in terms of that technology, it's, it's capable of doing some amazing things. Think about the systems that he has inside in this technology. He has a, a dedicated computer system. He has rocket repulsors in the gauntlets and gloves. He's rockets in the boots in the back. He can fire weapons from all manner of locations around his body. But he's got a little problem. But I'm sure Tony Stark solved this because he's a genius, right? So as his suit uses electrical energy, as any electrical device uses electrical energy, it does one thing, produces waste thermal energy, waste heat. So you can imagine like Tony Stark flying around in the Avengers film in 2012, doing all these things, firing his rockets, and uh, he's generating all this excess thermal energy. Where's it going? You know, so let's be honest about it. If you're wearing that suit, things are going to get decidedly uncomfortable. That is where thermoelectric materials come. These materials actually exist and have been used for, for, for many, many years. For example, NASA have used them in the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecrafts. And what the thermal electric material does is it converts waste thermal energy into electrical energy. It's like a battery recycler. These devices have also been used in the Curiosity rover on Mars is powered by thermoelectric materials. And these materials have actually been used in the exhaust systems of cars to reclaim thermal energy from the exhaust system and also in the climate control system of cars. I'll give you one other example. The X-Men universe is extensive. There are hundreds of characters in the X-Men universe. Maybe your favorite character is the man who can control people's minds or the man who can control metal. Maybe somebody here likes the character who can control storms and the weather or the woman who can gather anyone else's power and copy it. There are some incredible powers and abilities. For me, the best power in the X-Men universe is the character who can turn his entire outside of his skin into an organic steel layer that gives him additional protection, it gives him this impenetrable layer, which protects not only his skin, but also his internal organs. 
This character's name is Colossus, and Colossus can be seen in some of the X-Men films and in the aforementioned Deadpool movies, which you've got to go see. So this power that he has, it sounds extraordinary, an impenetrable layer around his skin. Does that, and could that actually exist? And the answer to that is actually, yes, it could. Because people are actually using two, two types of materials. I'll give you two examples. Some people are actually using spider silk to make bulletproof vests. You might think that is crazy. But spider silk is one of the toughest materials on the planet. And not only are they talking about using spider silk in bulletproof vests, they're also trying to integrate it into electronic devices that can actually, for example, one group have made heart monitors using spider silk. Another material people are actually turning to is graphene. Now, you might have heard of graphene, and graphene was, well, came into emergence in 2004, and it got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. But many people say that graphene is looking for a game changer. It needs something to, you know, spice it up and spice up the application. Maybe this is the application. Maybe research groups setting out towards creating Colossus and penetrability clothing or suit would be the technology or the, the killer application, of course. The idea of having an Iron Man suit, the idea of having an invisibility cloak, and maybe having this impenetrability suit sound absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, they don't exist today. That will be in the future. And you sitting in front of me today, and anyone who's, who's seeing this talk, you may have the chance to make a decision which can be very important and change your lives. Should I become involved in scientific research? And if I do, will I be the one making the choices in the future? For example, will you be the person who decides that, yes, I'm going to make the invisibility cloak and make it available to everyone on the planet? Or will you be the person who figures out all of the problems and issues with the Iron Man suit? Now, of course, we just cannot take this technology and dump it into human society and expect that everyone's going to use it in, a, in, a, in an orderly manner. We have to make sure that we predict when we should introduce this technology. We have to make sure that we introduce it in a controlled manner. We have to make sure that we monitor people using it and make sure that it's easily integrated and easily changeable with new advances in technology. We certainly would like to have more Captain Americas and Batmans and less Ultrons and Jokers. Now, I'm going to leave you with a little thought. First of all, my Iron Man suit is charging in the back and I'll be flying off after this, which is great, but I'm going to leave you with some questions just to ponder. Are you ready for a super future? Are you ready to make some extraordinary decisions that could dictate the course of your career? Are you ready to engage with scientific research that could change the world? Are you ready to create things that can not only benefit society, but also make your favorite superheroes come to life? Have you picked out your costume and designed your logo? Some of you have got your own power stances already. Have some of you got your own superhero name? But most importantly, are you ready to unlock the secrets of superhero science? Thank you very much. Thank you.